Let's do it. It's an early, damp morning, and I'm walking to the hospital where I've been working the last couple of weeks. If you were close to me, you would see that I have a very firm face, and I walk with a fast pace because we have some serious problems. First of all, we are not making any money. Five patients, 120 staff. That doesn't add up. Secondly, we are not paying our staff correctly. We're paying them below the minimum standard in the city, which is a crime. And thirdly, we found out that the operational permit to even run a hospital has not been renewed in one and a half year. But that's not why I'm walking so fast, because I want to check in on the renovation project that we've been running. As I enter the hospital, something is off. I see buckets of water, there's buckets collecting water dripping down, and when I look up, I see big stains of mold, and there's a stench of mold in there. This is our x-ray machine, and that bucket collects 100 liters of water. But hold on, there's a whole another floor up. So I go back up, I get back outside again, and I look up, and I see this. What's missing from this picture? There's no roof. But hold on, it's raining every day in this city. Have they not put the roof back on? So I go back in again and I see more and more disturbing signs of something being really off. Here's water dripping down into our pharmacy. I'm no electrician, but water into the fuse box could not be good. And even Jesus has mold on him. <laughs> so now I go back up again to the second floor and I'm greeted by this sight. The roof has practically been thrown down on the floor and then lying there for days where rain has soaked it into a moldified a big mush of uh, earth and rubble. And there's a horrible stench here. I also realized that I'm the first one from the hospital up here. They don't know. I continue around the second floor here and I see that about 60% of all our beds in the hospital is destroyed. The sight is too much for me, and I fall down to my knees, and I just start to cry. The only thing we could do, really, was to start to dig. I was in these exact clothes when I started, and I didn't even have any shovel. We just could just start to throw things out of the window. But in the back of my head, I had one thought. This hospital is dead. There's no recovery from this. Hello and welcome to this presentation on how agile principles save the hospital or if you want to, how transparency, trust and vulnerability save the hospital. Uh, because I realized after a while that that's actually the thing that made a difference. I wanted to tell that story today. I'm Marcus, I have been worked as a programmer, a consultant and an agile coach for a very, very long time. Most things I do is around lean and agile. And when I don't do that, I care about my family, my instrument, the euphonium, and my church, the Salvation Army. I also written a book on Kanban. It's actually the best book on Kanban I ever written. <laughs> and today you're lucky because one of my good friends is here and we wrote it together and he had got come across a, a code, so you can get that book for 40% off. So if I'm an IT guy, why am I in Indonesia and doing stuff to that poor hospital? Well, me and my wife, we decided to work a couple of years for our church, the Salvation Army, that runs six hospitals and 17 clinics in Indonesia. I was supposed to help all of these <coughs> hospital establish strategic plans, but that progressed pretty slowly, so instead, uh, we could help the hospital that was in this city where I lived. Bandung, who heard about Bandung before? You, Joachim, okay. Eight million people live there, All right? So it's a pretty big city. I wanted to tell this story from the perspective of three women. Uh, so it will be like a short slivers of uh, uh, information here and maybe not the complete story. And the first lady I want you to meet is Ibu Butet. Ibu means Mrs. So Mrs. Butet. I'm Mr. Marcus, by the way. Uh, and this is a story about transparency. But before I can tell that story, you need to get some more information. We had many problems, as I said, but we decided that the number one problem was cash flow. Someone actually calculated that we were six weeks out of bankruptcy when we started to make these changes. So we needed to get patients to come to our hospital or this will all be over. So we made that our priority number one. Priority number one, so important that we're working on it. Okay. The strange thing was that 
people seem to know about this, and, but they just didn't care. So I needed a way to show them the state. And not only that, I needed a way to make them feel how this was as well. So we got together and started to calculate how much money do we need to run this hospital for a month. But this is expressed in Indonesian rupees per month, and I can't even pronounce this. So we broke it down and said, OK, what's that per day then? But still, that doesn't make any sense, because it was like 20 million rupees per day when the lady in the laundry that I told that to, she earned 1 million rupees per month. So she could not relate to that. So what we did instead was that we started to count how many patients do we serve in a day. And we came up with, OK, we need to serve 134 patients in one day. And we made that our target, and we made a huge diagram, much bigger than needed, uh, because I drew it. And I'm about 30 centimeters taller than the average Indonesian person, so they could never reach. But that was not the problem, because we were so far off. Here's the goal, and here we are. So what do you think happened when I showed them this diagram? Well, something like that. I'm rushing now, because I'm out, I have so little time. There were not much reaction. I just saw people looking blankly before them or doing something with their phone or beep, 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 giggling in the back. So I got really m angry, actually, and because I wanted them to, uh, to see this. And I went up and I drew another line, this one. And in my anger, I misspelled it. This is the break-even point. And I told the staff, every time we're below that line, we lost money by having the hospital open that day. And that everyone understood. So we got some really good things out of these, uh, that uh, visualization. And we cr collected them in some kind of rule set or code for how to do good visualizations. Well, code and code. It's uh, more like the pirate code. We break it if we need it to. But here's the Bungsu Rumasakit means hospital. So the Bungsu hospital visualization pirate code. The first one is that you want this to be big, meaning that everyone can see it. Put it in the corridor. Make it visual, make it interesting to look at. The second is that it needs to be easy for everyone to understand. Thirdly, we're focusing on trends because we're measured to learn. We, I don't care if it's 76 or 78. I care if it goes up when it's supposed to go up. We need a target, we realized, because otherwise it got really boring pretty quickly. And speaking of that, you want stuff that moves and updates frequently. We could have shown this once a month, but then we have lost the interest immediately. Now we show the staff every morning how we did yesterday. And it took two days before you could hear this. Oh, yay! Stuff like that. Because people engaged. Let me tell you what happens if, that, if that's the case. Ibu Butet here, she's a physiotherapist slash receptionist at the hospital. She came up to us after we have shown this diagram a couple of times, and she said, I have an idea to get more patients to the hospital. At this point in time, the Indonesian government was implementing the public health insurance uh, for the first time ever in Indonesia. 250 million people got access to public health. And uh, needless to say, uh, the hospital were not ready, the government was not ready, and the, in, uh, the people were not ready. But Ibu Butet met these people every day because she was in the reception. And she said, I know what questions they ask. I have an idea for how to make this better. And we said, perfect, let's do it. Not so fast, she said. If we do this, I want a big banner outside the hospital that says, this is where BPGS, the public health insurance, is fast, easy, and comfortable. Was it? Yeah. My Indonesian slips my mind sometimes. That was really strange, but okay, let's do it. So we put it on there, here's the proof. And you know what? Amazing things happen. This is just a couple of days after she came to us. This is a month after, because that, uh, let me go back, this is the first time we were above 120, the break-even point, ever. So I bought cake to an entire hospital, which cost me about $5. And then this is the first time we're above our target. It can be done, and I bought cake again. And then six months later, we did other things as well, but six months later, this happened. We had to pull up a chair to reach that. But this is an amazing point in time, because all of a sudden, we were not losing money on average. 
on average, we were making money every day. But the most amazing thing was that uh, BPG, as the governmental branch, they called us up and said, we hear good things. Can you please host a workshop for other hospitals of your size in the city? This is the director of the hospital. We'll meet her later. Imagine the pride of her here. Her hospital was in rubbles just six months ago. And now she's the role model for all of these people that are also running hospitals there. And then I went all the way to the back here and I found the Ibu Butet. She's just a receptionist. So what happened here? Well, the first thing we did was that we start where we are. were. So we didn't invent anything new. We just said, okay, this is the place we are. And we were very transparent with this is what we need to, be, to do. And then we showed everyone with a visualized, understandable and uh, metric that matters, that everyone could relate to. People through our door. Everyone can understand that. And finally, we supported initiatives from the floor. So when Ibu Butet came to us, we listened, even though she was just a receptionist. Second lady I want you to meet is Ibo Elshi. This photo is actually taken this summer. If you zoomed in, you could see her lipstick on my color here because <laughs> we had just hugged before this. Uh, Ibo Elshi, she's a general manager of the hospital. That means that she's in charge of anything that is not health or finance. And that's a lot of things in a hospital. So it's, you have security, ambulance, food, they were stitching stuff together, they were doing laundry, and then they were doing maintenance. And this hospital was suffering hugely under maintenance, a lack of maintenance. She came to us because she was under severe pressure. You see the faces of the other people here, they don't like her and they got nothing done. Uh, and she got really stressed as well. And sadly, I was partly to blame because we were running a morning meeting with the management team every day now. And when we did that, the, her priorities changed like this. So now people got so frustrated waiting for the maintenance staff that they bypassed her, so she had to play catch up. So she said this, I have a lot of things to do, but I get nothing done. Anyone recognize that? And I don't want to go around the hospital anymore because every time I go into a room, I get more things to do. And she was sobbing when she said that thing. So we decided to try to help her. And it was really a blessing because we d were discussing such stupid details in the management team. For example, which is the best order of the doctor's names outside the hospital? Or what kind of net do you need to get rats out of the sewer? That's from my house, by the way. Uh, so I took one of my few direct decisions and I said, OK, from now on, Ibo Elshi, we trust you to take care of maintenance for us. We will not talk about that here. You do that and report back to us on Fridays. And then we gave her some structure over her days also. So we said, uh, in the morning, you have a morning meeting with your staff for 15 minutes. Then you go around the hospital for one hour. So we only had a time box for that. Not until you're done, but for one hour. And then we did something else. In the afternoon, we added an hour of slack time. Don't book anything here. This is for stuff that you didn't have time to do in the rest of the day. Finally, we, uh, not finally, one more thing. So second to finally, we said that we want you to limit how many things you are doing at the same time. So do three maintenance things. And when I said that, something really strange happened because she looked up to me with tears in her eyes and she just said, can I do that? Yes, you can do that. That is called being a professional, saying no. The last thing we did was to make the policies around all of this very explicit. And a very good example of that was that we told the maintenance staff, don't work on anything that is not written on this yellow slip. And that yellow slip was in the pocket of Ibo Elshi. So they didn't do anything until it was written and she wrote it. So what happened then? Well, three days after we made all of these changes, but of course that was pretty easy to do, she came up to me and she said, I have nothing to do. And I was really worried. I thought something has gone horribly wrong, but okay, let, let her rest. And then on the first Friday, we were supposed to get the report back from Ibo Elshi. 
Uh, but in Indonesia, there's 35 public holidays per year, so a good place to work, by the way. Uh, so we had to wait for another week. And just before she started to report, I realized that I don't know how many things they normally get done in a week. So I said, how much? Oh, well, three things. Usually one, two to three things. Okay, so two weeks, six, eight, ten. I'm, I'm hoping for ten. Well, she reported 46 items completed in three weeks, in two weeks. And remember that she said that she had nothing to do. So it was the best morning meeting of my life. It took so long that I had to drag up a chair. And after a while, I actually started to record it. So I wanted to show this little movie of Ibo Elshi here. And I want you to watch her and watch the faces of the other people. Two weeks ago, they were hating her guts for not getting stuff done. And I hope that the sound is not too loud. Suda, that means it's fixed. Sempurna means with excellence. So what happened here? Well, to be quite honest, we just uncovered Ibo Elchi's awesomeness. But we did that with some really simple tools. We moved the authority to the imp information. We showed I Ibo Elchi trust and required transparency back. We made policies explicit and we limit the working process. I'm wearing this shirt for another reason as well. Three weeks after this happened, she came to me and she said, Marcus, your sleeve has come untied. And I'm a Swedish man, so I said, I'll stitch that up later tonight. Uh, but she said, no, I can do that for you. Come on, well, you can't do that, you're, you're a general manager. No, I have time. So she took me to her small office that's located under the stairs, like Harry Potter. And uh, I had to take this off. It was about 30 degrees warm, but she still wrapped me in a blue blanket and I snuck into her office. Her English is not good and my Indonesian is crap. So it just got silent. And we sat there for a while as she stitched this together for me. And it was a beautiful moment of sharing gratitude for her new situation at life, which was easy for me to make room for. Very quickly, the last thing I want you to talk about, uh, want to talk about is for the entire hospital. Remember where we started? I went in here and I came down. And then when I came down the stairs, I met the management team. And they looked at me and they said, Marcus, help us. And I responded in the only way I could respond. I said, no, you need to help me. I have no idea how to run a hospital. This is the director of the hospital, Dr. Lillian. And uh, she needed help, and all she got was, well, this guy, a uh, white IT guy from Sweden. Uh, so we both said, we don't know what to do. I have no ID. So we showed each other vulnerability. We said, we don't know. We said, I was wrong. We were very open with that, unlike some other um, uh, leaders in our world. So, when you do that, amazing things can happen. Uh, this is the last photo I have of the hospital. This is like half of the staff. And we said goodbye, like, can you see me, by the way? Yeah. Uh, uh, so we said goodbye in this, uh, after this photo. And uh, when we did that, they all lined up in a long row and we were hugging each other. And I kind of expected that because we had spent so much time together. Uh, but what I did not expect was that they were all whispering the same kind of things in my ear as we hugged. And they said this, you were friendly. We were bad, but you didn't scream at us. You wanted to help us. They were not expecting that. They were expecting someone to come there and yell at them and then tell them what to do. Here's the problem, I can't do that. I'm too friendly, <laughs> but I don't know how to run a hospital. I still don't know how to run a hospital, but they do. I know how to get stuff done. So together, in both our vulnerabilities, we actually created something immensely strong. And they evolved the hospital, the hospital long after I left, the, uh, left them as well. And that's what you can do to engage an entire staff by showing vulnerability and transparency like this. So 
I worked for about one hour a day at this hospital, except for when we were digging. They did the rest. They were the heroes. I was merely a guide. Summary. Ibe Butet showed me what transparency can do to engage everyone in the hospital. Ibu Elshi showed me that trust and letting someone take care of their situation can actually increase both productivity while at the same time have a sustainable life. Dr. Lilian and the entire hospital staff showed me how vulnerability can unlock the potential of the entire organization. And with that, I want to say thank you for listening. And uh, I promised the staff that I will always wear this uniform when I talked about them. Uh, and I also promised them that I will say, Tuhan member Katianda, God bless you, Gud velsigne. Tack så mycket för att ni lyssnade. Omnivilla, if you want to read more, there's a book with more details. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you sir. Yeah. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>